I wanted to talk about self-interest in economics. And this is part of my mature economics series, which is basically the way you learn economics in an Econ 101 or an intermediate micro theory course is going to be different than the way you understand it as your understanding of the content matures. And the way I like to introduce self-interest and how to think flexibly about self-interest is to ask the question, if somebody is doing something for their family, is that self-interested? And this really introduces the notion of in-group and out-group when it comes to self-interest. So you might imagine there's lots of different in-groups that any one given person is part of and can act on behalf of, both generously on behalf of that in-group and cooperatively with the in-group, but also competitively and um, without attention to the needs and desires of the out-group. So family is one, church, uh, workplace community, that's another, and of course these can get bigger, so they can become city, state, nation, they can become not just the workplace community, but the industry that you, you're involved in. They can be racial groups or religious groups you belong to. So I'll represent that here. And you can imagine tons of different circles that this one person's self-interest might include at any given point in time. Now, it's relevant to think about salience frames because sometimes the person is focused on their family and doing what's best for their family, sometimes it's the industry, sometimes it's a larger group, and what determines that? There's a lot of things that determine it, but the concept of a salience frame is basically if you think about the lens of a camera, what is in focus, what is prominent in the lens of your camera, the thing you're thinking about right now? And what might be on the fuzzy edges, maybe not quite in full focus, but it's in the frame of the camera. And then what's not on the camera's frame? What, what are you not looking at at any given point in time? Now in economics, the salience frame is going to apply to a person's motivational forces. What, are, what is driving any given behavior at any given point in time? And you might imagine what makes something salient, there's tons of things that do that. The news can make certain in-group salient and out-group, in-group, out-group conflicts salient to you. If there's a threat to any particular in-group of yours, that in-group may become more salient and that out-group may become more salient. Your salience frame may depend on mood, it might change throughout the day, it depends on urgency, it depends on the social distance between you and your in-group and out-group or you and any given in-group. So there's many things that determine a person's salience frame when it comes to their in-group, out-group. And salience frames, they both move over the day, over any given decision space you're, you're acting within, but they also have some kind of stability over time where certain groups are generally prioritized prioritized because that's the people you spend the most time with. Now, if we think about self-interest as operating on the boundaries of one of these in-group, out-group frames, where you're acting in support of that in-group in a way that could be highly altruistic, but against the out-group where those interests conflict. There's this proverb that says, I against my brother. I and my brother against my cousin. I, my brother, and my cousin against the world. And that's kind of what's going on here, where within any given group here, we're going to have competition between the people in the group and conflict between the people in the group. But when that group in general gets threatened, like if you think of the competition within a group as a game, and maybe that's a game that you and your brother are playing competing for your mother's attention. But as soon as that game itself gets threatened by something in an out group that's really salient, and that matters to you, this group comes together and congeals against that outgroup. And that dynamic plays out at every single level of this in-group, out-group setup. And let me give you a couple more examples here. So let's say you have a bureaucracy, which could be a large corporation, or it could be a government bureaucracy, and there's different departments within that bureaucracy, each of which wants to have their own creative agency, they have their own ideas they want implemented. Those groups have to compete within the bureaucracy for whose ideas get to be implemented. However, if there comes to be a threat to that organization's existence, then those groups come together and fight the threat together. 
And this is actually, I think, one reason why bureaucracies like to get larger, is if the bureaucracy grows, then you can actually resolve this competition between these two subgroups of that corporation by letting both of them have their way, rather than deciding which of these two actually gets the money to implement their ideas. And then another manifestation of this has to do with the inequality landscape. So if you imagine people sort of at the top of the power hierarchy in society, they are competing with each other to see who has the highest seat, who has the most power in that context. And there's many different groups that are sort of sitting at the top competing in that way. But as soon as anything that might threaten the existing order comes along, where this group that has their game, their power battles playing out between them at the top, that's threatened such that they could all fall away and no longer even have those positions to fight against the other powerful people, they will come together and congeal to protect that uh, that, that in-group game, essentially. Now, the next point I wanna make about this relates to fractals. And what fractals are, are basically, if you look at different scales, you're going to see a very similar pattern at different scales. And the classic example here is a snowflake. So you see this pattern of the snowflake um, at the highest level, but then you zoom in to the next level and you see that same pattern, the same uh, little star I've made exists at the mid-level, and then you zoom in even further to the smallest level and you see the same exact pattern. And uh, my snowflake doesn't look very good, but seriously look up snowflake fractals online and you'll find some beautiful pictures that capture this, where specific snowflakes, sometimes with really intricate patterns, have this fractal nature to them. And you can predict what I'm going to say next. Basically, the same in-group, out-group dynamic with self-interest versus competition and cooperation, it plays out at every single level. And this includes the level within an individual. So within a person, there's going to be conflicting drives. Sometimes they want to do the selfish thing, and sometimes they want to do the generous thing, and sometimes those are in competition with one another, and that has to be resolved. And it could be that depending on your mood or depending on what news you consumed most recently, that's going to determine which of these different personalities inside yourself, which of those different drives, will win out for a given action. And you can see already here that um, the fact that we're placing different drives inside a person, it's behaving like the different drives that are within a family, that are, that are competing with each other, but also protecting the game that's that is that competition within the family. And so part of my point here has to do with the need for a flexibility of thought when you're thinking about what is the particular frame of self-interest that any given economist is talking about when they're trying to explain their understanding of a situation. But the degree of ambiguity actually is deeper than this. So I'm going to give a kind of dramatic example to make this clear. Imagine that the, the world is going into a war and there is a particular group of people, we'll call them the purple people, which of course is an in-group for somebody, and there's some chance, based on the zeitgeist of society, that that group will experience genocide through this war. Like there's some kind of animosity bubbling up. Um, where the purple people are starting to fear that kind of thing. And let's imagine a person, we'll call him Bob, who is a member of the purple people, and he starts to do a bunch of things that are protecting the purple people from genocide. The question I'm going to ask is, is this purely selfish? Is it individualistically selfish, where he just cares about himself? And the first answer is that you actually do not know. Because if Bob were the type of person who only had one personality inside him that only cared about himself, he would still do what he could to protect the purple people because that was the number one threat to Bob. So even if you make this a simplistic, purely selfish situation, he will do what he can to protect the purple people. But you could have a situation where he is entirely self-sacrificial on behalf of the purple people, and he will 
set aside his own individual interests at any time in sacrifice to the purple people. Or it could be that he recognizes, wait a second, the whole world will suffer if there's genocide of any type. So maybe his salience frame is really the whole world. And all three of those things could motivate that particular action. That is the action of protecting the purple people from genocide. But the type of ambiguity we're talking about goes deeper than even that. Because it's not even necessarily true that there is a truth about Bob. Either Bob is purely selfish, or Bob is selfish on behalf of the purple people, or Bob is purely altruistic for the whole world. It's not that one of those three things exists and will just be revealed if he ever has an opportunity to self-sacrifice. That's not it. It's a much deeper level of ambiguity. The fact is, this particular action, protecting his his purple people group, this action actually coheres multiple drives inside himself. Maybe he has all three of those drives, purely selfish, purple people, all of the world, that are fighting within him. But for this particular action, they recognize, actually, we can all work together. Um, we, we have not yet manifest which of us it will win out. As a matter of fact, whether he would sacrifice himself at the beginning of the war is something that is completely indeterminate. It's ambiguous in the sense that even he and even the deepest reality cannot tell what he would do and which of these different personalities in himself would win. Because part of the deal with the internal personalities is that it does depend on context and that context will evolve as the war moves forward. And in some ways, developing character is, is where you recognize, I want to be somebody who would sacrifice my, my own individual interests for the interests of a group I care about, or maybe for everybody. And I'm trying to develop that character inside myself by, um, by my daily actions and the way I embody my values. And those daily actions, the small things, will actually shape and determine uh, which of these personalities wins in the future. So my hope here is that you've come away with an intuition for the ambiguous nature of self-interest in economics, that it needs to be flexible, that what drives a person may not actually be manifest fully in a given moment. And obviously the converse is true about altruism. What is altruism? Is altruism uh, on behalf of an in-group at the expense of an out-group? Can you think of situations where the most altruistic thing might be to act on behalf of an in-group? There's so much going on here. And my hope is that this is helpful for you when you're looking at different situations, trying to comprehend what is driving different people, what are the different drives that could possibly exist, even if those drives are not yet manifest, either in a person's heart or just in a person's behavior.